honest with one another. We're family in here. Who wanted to just stay in bed today? Yeah, you're, yours, I mean, me too. Uh, I wanted to stay in bed today. Uh, but my love for you compelled me to get out of bed and to be here this morning. That's true. I do. I love you all very much. Um, oh, that was so sweet. Who said that? Was that you, Lisa? Oh, get out of here. Oh, good. Um, hey, before we dive in real quick, uh, for those who are partners, members at Fellowship Bible, we are one week left in our elder deacon evaluations. We made you aware of that via email. I think about a week and a half ago, Roger, our chairman of the elders, mentioned it last Sunday in the service. I want to mention it today that next Sunday, the 24th, officially ends that two-week evaluation period. And so if you need more information about that, you can see Kathy... Uh, out in the lobby. She's got some printed up copies if you prefer that, um, but refer to your email. And if you didn't get the email, uh, let Kathy know uh, in the lobby and, and we'll get you the email. But one, one more week for those uh, all important evaluations of elder and deacon uh, leadership of our church. Um, this morning we're continuing our study in the book of James. It's our next to last week in uh, the book of James before we enter the Advent season. In two weeks uh, for Advent, I'll start a new series titled, He Shall Be Called. And in that series of four weeks in Advent, we're just going to take a look at some of the names for Jesus that we find in the Christmas narrative. So think things like Emmanuel and Messiah and Savior, that sort of thing. So uh, today is the next to last week in James, and uh, we'll wrap it up next week. And uh, so we're on the downslope of James. So if you've got your Bible, you've got your James journal with you this morning, would you turn with me to James chapter 5? James chapter 5. Today, James is going to address the issue of, <clears throat> or issues of wealth and money and stewardship, and he's also going to talk about sin in regard to stewardship, and he, he's going to do this through the lens, uh, or these categories of rich and poor. Rich and poor. Um, so, just a question as we dive in this morning. When you hear those categories, and when you hear those words, rich and poor, what comes to mind for you? When you think about rich or poor, how do you see yourself in those categories? Do you see yourself as rich? Do you see yourself as poor? Um, how, how do you view others through that lens? Now, before you consider your answer, uh, whether you consider yourself rich or poor, I want to try to give you some perspective this morning. So I'm going to share some stats with you in just a second. Um, and what you should know about this is I, I was on a mission trip to Honduras back in 2015, and the mission organization that I was with did a presentation while we were on that mission trip and shared some statistics with me that just kind of blew me away. So I asked the guy that was doing the presentation, hey, can you just forward me those stats? And, um, and so I came across that again this week, and then I updated them because most of those stats were a little old. And so I went on several different websites, demographic websites uh, this week to try and update the information I'm about to share with you. So here's the thought experiment before we get into it, okay? If we could take the entire world population of 8 billion plus people and we could shrink it down to a 100-person village, okay? You tracking with me so far? We've got 8 billion people on the planet, but we're going to shrink it down to a 100-person village, and that village is going to reflect what would be the average demographics across the entire globe, okay? I used a round number, 100, just to make this super easy. So if you're looking at the world, if we were to take a look at our village and just layered on top of it several of the demographics that we find globally over our 100-person village, here's what we'd find. When it comes to nationality, 60 of the people in the village would be Asian Indian. That's phenomenal <laughs> right there, that most of the world lives in that, ge now it's a pretty large geographic area, um, but that, that's India and China and, and, and lots of the east over there. 18 would be Africans. 13 would be from the Americas, and that includes Canada, North America, Latin America, and South America. And then nine would be Europeans. 
So far, so good? Okay. If you look at our village, when it comes to gender, 49 would be female, 51 would be male. So, Letourneau, you're right about something. (laughs) Race, uh, 73 would be non-white, 27 in the village would be white or pale skin. When it comes to religion, 31 would be Christian, 24 would be Muslim, 15 would be Hindu, 7 would be Buddhist, and then 23 would be, uh, there's some other offshoot, you know, religions, and, and then there's the, you know, atheism and agnosticism, that sort of thing. Uh, they would fall into that other camp. Just some miscellaneous for you, 40 would live in substandard housing, 10 would be illiterate, 10 would suffer from malnutrition, One would be near death, one would be near birth. Only four would have a college education, but 60 would own a cell phone. (laughs) Oh, so funny. And then when it comes to wealth, one person would earn $1 million or more per year, 12 would earn between 10K to a million annually, 34 would earn between 10K to 100K, and 53 would earn less than 10K annually. So it seems like if you make at least $10,000, you are in like the upper 50% um, of the world with regards to wealth. So now we've got a little bit of a global perspective. There's one more thing I need to do to lay a foundation for today's message before we dive in. The Bible, one of its predominant themes, the Bible talks a ton about wealth. But what I've found is that we tend to look at the world either through the haves or the have-nots or the rich or the poor, the wealthy or those who are not wealthy. And I think the Bible uses more categories than that. In fact, I know that it does. Um, There's four categories of wealth that we see in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, at least four. And so let me give them to you real quick, and then we'll jump into James. Um, One of those four categories is the godly poor. Let me give you just a few examples, okay? Jesus would fall into this camp. Uh, Jesus came from a lower class family. He came from a Jewish family, very religious family. They were godly people, uh, but they were poor. It would have been considered lower class. This would be a woman named Ruth that we see in Scripture. She's godly and poor. This uh, would include uh, when James earlier in our study referred to widows and orphans that were not being taken care of in the church. These are godly people. uh, They're poor. Perhaps in our day, it would be the single mom who's part of our congregation who uh, she's lost her husband. And she's got some kids, and she is struggling to make ends meet. She is working hard, doing the very best that she can uh, to provide for her household. That's godly poor people, people who love the Lord, doing the very best that they can, but but still uh, are considered poor or are struggling. The second category is the godly rich, okay? So these are people who love the Lord. They've been blessed with wealth. Biblically speaking, this would be Abraham, this would be Job, Uh, this would be Joseph of Arimathea who gave a a wealthy man's tomb for Jesus to be buried in. This would include a woman named Lydia who funded a lot of the ministry and the mission work that we see in the New Testament. They're godly people, but they're also wealthy. I know some very godly people who are poor. I know some very godly people who are wealthy and rich. The third category is the ungodly poor. Proverbs talks a lot about this group of people, right? These are people who don't work. These are people who are lazy. These are people who squander away opportunity and wealth, okay? Now, we know that according to Scripture, we are designed to work. We've we've been created kind of in that image. We're supposed to work, not to be lazy, not to squander away opportunities to provide for ourselves and for our families, And then lastly, the ungodly rich. And we see the ungodly rich throughout the Bible. This would be our Herods. This would be our our Pharaohs. um, This would be some of the other godless political leaders that we read about in Scripture. These are people who had a lot of money, had a lot of fame, had a lot of power. um, But the way they got it and what they do with it is ungodly. 
And so when you consider these four categories of the ungodly poor, the ungodly rich, and the godly poor, and the godly rich, which category are you in? Today, we are going to primarily focus on categories one and four, the godly poor and the ungodly rich. James is going to have some very strong words this morning for those who are ungodly and wealthy. Because to who much is given, much is what, Jesus said. Required, expected. And so the context that we have before us this morning is financial, that if God's going to put a lot in your hands, he wants you to be generous and not waste what you've been given. So let's take a look at this. This is James chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. James writes, Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasure in the last days. Okay, so here's what I want you to see. James starts with this um, category of the the ungodly rich. And he tells us here in these first three verses um, a couple of things of what they're primarily guilty of. Uh, The first thing he says is they're guilty of hoarding. And then what he's going to tell us here in a minute is they're also guilty of defrauding. And this is important because what James doesn't say here, James didn't say no one should be rich. He didn't say it was sinful to have money and wealth. What he's implying here is that those who are rich should be sharing, not hoarding. Okay, so let's talk about hoarding for a minute. If you're familiar with the teaching of Jesus, and James would have been since they were brothers, here's what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, he says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay. So check this out. Chronology is important in this context, okay? It starts with Jesus. You see, Jesus gave instructions on finances during his earthly ministry. And the passage we just read comes from the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon that we studied earlier uh, last year, earlier this year, that Jesus gave to his disciples and many other people were within earshot. And in the sermon, Jesus is giving instructions Um, on how people should handle wealth. And apparently the ungodly rich have not heeded them, and now years later, decades later, James is rebuking these people. Jesus says, in essence, you have so many clothes, you don't even wear them. You have so much stuff, you put it in a closet and the moths eat your clothes. That's not a wise use of your clothes. This, This is what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. He's like, don't just pile stuff up. Especially stuff that you don't need, right? Share your stuff. Paralleling that idea, because there's a lot of parallels between James uh, and what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. So paralleling that idea, James says, your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. You've got so much gold and silver just kind of laying around, you don't even use it. It's corroding. And so here's the big idea. You can't take your stuff and your riches and your wealth with you, but here's what Jesus says, you can send it on ahead. That's what Jesus is saying. In essence, he's saying, hey, store, don't, you know, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where these things, where your wealth doesn't decay, where people don't break in and steal. Be, be generous while you're here on earth. And then God, who in the end does all the accounting, will reward you faithfully in eternity. So just to be clear, he's not talking about the godly rich. Because the godly rich are generous. Sometimes, listen to me, sometimes uh, the reason that godly people are wealthy is because they're givers and they're generous. And so... 
God just keeps giving them more because he knows that he can entrust them with it. Now, be sure you heard what I just said. Okay, generosity doesn't equal wealth. It also doesn't equal trust. It's not like, well, if you're poor, God doesn't trust you. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying sometimes people who are wealthy are wealthy because they're generous. God just simply entrusts them with more. That is not the situation or the scenario here. Okay, this is the ungodly rich. He says that their clothes are rotting, their wealth corroding because it's just sitting idle. They're not using it appropriately, okay? So the first problem is they're hoarding things. And listen, it's not that you don't have the right to take your money and your wealth and to, and to buy stuff with it. But if you have things, he's saying, that you don't even need, if you have things that you don't even use and your heart isn't open to helping people and serving people um, and, and blessing others, then he's like, then you don't have the heart of God because that's God's heart. God has a generous heart. God has a heart that wants to bless people. God has a sharing heart. Let's meet one another's needs. And so James first rebukes the ungodly rich for hoarding. Now he's going to address the issue of defrauding the godly poor. Let's take a look. James chapter 5, verse 4. Look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You have lived luxuriously on the earth, have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous who does not resist you. Okay. So once again, like he's done many times before, James is using a little story, an illustration to make a point. And he says that there's two groups. He says that there's landowners and, and, and there's laborers. And, and the landowners are going to be un, the ungodly rich, and the laborers here are going to be like the godly poor. They're going to be righteous, righteous laborers. And, 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 and so we have these landowners. They don't love the Lord. They don't serve the Lord. They're ungodly rich. The laborers that he's speaking of do love the Lord. They're on the receiving end of a tremendous injustice, and so they're crying out to God. That's the scene. These are hardworking people who are supposed to get paid at the end of the day for mowing the lawn, and so they show up and they mow the lawn, uh, but they don't get paid. So he's not talking about the ungodly poor. He's not talking about lazy people who refuse to work. Uh, those who refuse to submit authority can't keep a job. He's talking about hardworking, honest, righteous, put food on the table, salt of the earth kind of folks. And really, here's what's happening. Behind this rebuke that James is giving regarding hoarding and defrauding, there's really two underlying ideologies here, two worldviews on how we view wealth. And it basically comes down to ownership versus stewardship. These are massive biblical categories. Um, this is how the ungodly rich are thinking. They're thinking in terms of ownership. So let's just unpack ownership real quick. I'm going to give you four things real quick um, that owners believe. Here's the first thing that, that owners, people who have an ownership mindset believe. The first thing that they believe is this. I do not belong to the Lord. I personally uh, don't belong to the Lord. There might be a God. I don't know. I don't, I don't believe in him. Uh, I don't worship him. I mean, maybe if he wants to come serve me, that would be great. But I don't belong to the Lord. Here's the second thing owners think. Nothing I have belongs to the Lord, right? So that's pretty natural. If I don't belong to the Lord, then uh, my stuff doesn't belong to the Lord. What I drive, where I live, where I go on vacation, all of those things, right? That's all mine. That's not his. That's mine. I don't belong to the Lord. My stuff doesn't belong to the Lord. Here's the third thing owners think. I deserve all that I work for. Right? Hey, there's just winners and losers in life, baby. And if I have a lot of money, I'm a winner. And if you don't, you're a loser. That's just kind of how it works, right? It's mine. I work for it. I deserve it. Um, you lose, I win. I deserve it all. 
And then here's the fourth thing, that I only answer to myself. Owners think I only answer to myself, or I'm not going to answer to God, I'm not going to give an account, uh, there's not going to be a day of judgment when I stand in front of God and he asks me, uh, well, you know, how, how did I do with the things that he's given me and my stuff? And that's not the way that it works, right? I give an account to myself, I rule over myself, I'm in charge of myself. That is the underlying ideology that James is going after, I believe, in regard to the ungodly rich. Like, you just have an ownership mentality. You just left God out of the equation. But biblically, there's another way. It's antithetical to that, and it's stewardship. So let's take a look at what stewardship is. Stewards say this. They recognize that, well, I do belong to Jesus. It's not that I don't belong to the Lord. I do belong to Jesus, right? Romans 1.6 says, you who are also called by Jesus Christ. And so if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you have confessed and believed in him as Savior, then you recognize that you are not your own, right? That you belong to someone else. And this changes our perspective, doesn't it? Here's the second thing stewards think. Everything I have belongs to God. Haggai 2.8 says, The silver and the gold belong to me. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. It's God's way of saying, it's all mine. Like, I, it's everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all God's stuff. This is why when we think about stewardship and, and giving to the ministry of the church and tithing, we shouldn't think in terms of, hey, do, do, do I give or am I supposed to give? Do I give 10% uh, to the church? No, you give 100%. Like everything belongs to God. Listen, uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But as a church, we have some things like budget-wise that we feel like the Lord's calling us to do, things that require financial resources to be all that we can be in this community. I know we've been in budget planning meetings as we look ahead to 2025, right? And we're never going to get to where we feel like God wants us to be until some of you in the room understand this. I mean, if you are a Christ follower and... Um, you call this your church. You're a member. You're a partner here. Maybe you're not a member or a partner. You've been attending faithfully for years and years, and people stop you on the street and, and, and say, where do you go to church? And you tell them, uh, Fellowship Bible Church. If you are here and you're not regularly tithing and investing in the ministry of the church, it's because you've yet to understand this, and I love you enough to tell you that. You think you own everything. And God says, no, I own it all. All the gold, all the silver, it's all mine. And so it's not how much of what I have do I give to the Lord. It's how much of really what already belongs to the Lord am I going to give back to him. I mean, you should just flip that. It's, it's just kind of like, oh, you're going to give me 90% of your stuff? It's a good deal. I'll take it. What a bargain. Third, a stewardship mindset recognizes everything I have is a gift. I love when Paul uh, said it this way in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, for who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? He's like, it's all, you've been given a gift, Here's a little exercise for you to, to help you understand this. Maybe later on this afternoon when you get home and you've taken a nap and you've watched your favorite football team or whatever it is, just take out a piece of paper this afternoon and at the top of that piece of paper just write, what has Jesus given me? And then just go to town writing. And, and you'll just be absolutely astounded and amazed of what you've received from the giver of good gifts. Everything we have is a gift. And finally, if I belong to the Lord and everything I have belongs to the Lord and everything I have is a gift from the Lord, then that makes me a steward of the Lord. 
And so stewards say, hey, Lord, do you want me to help them? Because you've helped me. But Lord, do you want me to be generous here in this area of my life? Lord, you've been generous with me. Right, a steward recognizes and realizes if it's Jesus' stuff, then he ultimately gets to decide what he wants to do with it. You're just the conduit through which those blessings pass on to others. So James uses this example in these categories of the rich and the poor to go after our hearts or pocketbooks, as it were, this morning. Challenging us to do good and not waste our wealth to share and be generous. But finally, as we close, there's just one last theme here that I want to point out to you. It's kind of layered over the top of this, and it's not maybe quite obvious at first, but three times in these six verses, James makes reference to the last days or the coming judgment. Now, when you read that phrase, the last days, in the New Testament, I don't want this to confuse anybody, but a lot of times when you read that phrase, in the last days, in the New Testament, it's talking about um, when Jesus has already come 2,000 years ago. Like they thought they were in the last days. In fact, Hebrews 1 says, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. So, so sometimes when the Bible talks about the last days, it's talking about 2,000 years ago, but sometimes it's talking about the future. All right, and so we believe that Jesus has already come once, but when he comes again, the next episode in God's dealings with his world is not another prophet, and it's not another chance. The next episode of Christ's return is for the second and the final time, and that's what we're waiting for. And when Jesus comes again for the second time, friends, there will be judgment. The first time he, he comes as a lamb to die. The second time he comes as a lion to conquer. He comes in humility the first time, dying on a cross. The second time, he comes in such a way that Revelation 6 says that if you don't know him, the Bible says that you'll cry out to the mountains. Literally, you can go there and read it. Literally, you're like, please save me. And wrapped up in all of what James is saying here, he says, stop and think about that for a minute. Remember who's coming. Like, don't give in to the temptation just to live for yourself. Don't give in to the temptation to just live in the temporal, just right here in the here and now. And so in light of what James is said last week, right, that life is short, that tomorrow's not promised, and then this week he's mentioning the last days. Here's what I want to ask us all this morning. How do you want your story on this earth to end? When it's your time, right, because life is short, tomorrow's not promised. We might be in the last days. There's a coming judgment of the Lord. How do you want your story on this earth and your stuff to end, do you want to die and people go, man, he drove a really nice car. I mean, they had a really, really nice house and a lake house to go with it. Or, or do you envision yourself hanging on to nothing but just clinging to Jesus? Because you've used everything that he's given you. You've used your gifts. You've used your wealth while you're here on earth, sending it on, a, on ahead, storing up for yourself treasures in heaven, a life where you've been generous, always sharing everything that you had. James says here to us today, don't waste your life. Live it for him. Live it for Jesus because he's the only one worth living for. Amen? Amen.
we've come to that time in our service where we want to respond um, to what is on our hearts and minds today, maybe what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives and how He's stirring uh, in us this morning. So I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come back to the stage. And it's during this time that we respond in a few different ways. We can respond to giving to the Lord, and so we have our faith boxes that are in the back of the room if you came prepared to give uh, this morning. Um, thank you so much. And this is an act of worship, just as much as praying and singing and opening the Word together. And so if during this time you want to uh, take advantage of using the giving box, you can do that, the faith boxes, or you can do that each and every week on your way in or on your way out. But we respond to the Lord through giving. We respond to the Lord through prayer. And so in just a moment, some members of our prayer team will be down front here. If you'd like to come and pray with somebody or if you'd just like to uh, come and spend some time uh, of your own accord here at the altar, um, we invite you to come and to pray. And uh, last but not least, but importantly, we sing during this time. And so our band's going to lead us. And before they lead us, let's pray together. Um, Thank you, Lord, for words that pierce and convict. Uh, Help us, Lord, this morning as we learn to live for you and to live for your glory alone. Um, Help us as individuals and as a church uh, to be good stewards of all that you've allowed us to steward. And, oh God, keep us Um, every one of us in here from wasting our lives. Help us to be generous with what is rightly yours. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus.